Yes. Okay, great. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this week's SEDS Online webinar. My name is Chelsea Pedersen, and uh, this week we are going to have a really great talk from Jesus Riolid. Um, we first want to thank all of our sponsor or our sponsorship from the IAS, which helps us deliver these webinars as well as other information to you free of charge. Make sure and check out the website. There's um, tons of resources, including uh, virtual field trips and different types of learning tools. So today's lecture is by Dr. Jesus Riolid. He's a postdoc at the Department of Stratigraphy and Paleontology at the University of Granada. He received his PhD from the University of Hamburg. Uh, Jesus' research focuses on marine sedimentology, paleontology, and paleoclimatology. He's been on a bunch of different research cruises, including the IODP cruise to the Maldives that he'll talk to us about today. He even does different types of geology illustrations for museums and children's books, which is super cool in my eyes. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about the technology of carbonate drifts. And Jesus, I will give you the mic. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Chelsea. And yes, as Chelsea just said, I'm Dr. Jesus Violid, and I'm working for the Department of Stratigraphy and Paleontology at the University of Granada. And today I want to talk about the technology of carbonate drifts. So first of all, we have to know what is a drift. Drift have been studying for the last years in, all around the, the oceans and sometimes even on shore. And there is plenty of definitions. So I try to make my own definition of drift out of the common items that are appearing in every definition in the literature. So then I will say that a drift is a large scale sedimentary body mainly produced by the action of a long slope bottom currents, usually at deep marine environments. As you may have seen, I was I have quite caution in some parts with mainly and usually because there are some exceptions. So first of all, it's a large scale sedimentary body. Why? Because we all know from the sedimentology that every current is producing different sedimentary structures. So we have all the different uh, in increasing energy and green side, we have different sedimentary structure all the way from ripples to mega ripples, dunes, sand waves. So if a drift is a sedimentary body that might be composed of these different structures, so we may found dunes or we may found sand waves inside of that drift. So it should be something larger. Usually, or we have at least no doubt when we found it in the seismic scale, but they could be also smaller. As you see in this figure, with a lot of bed forms that I extract from Rebecca Square in 2014. It really, in, oh, sorry. In relation with the with intensity of the current or the velocity of the flow, we have different sedimentary structure with different uh, grain sizes. That is going to be interesting because we are, I'm going to be showing drift. We have really, really different phases, all the way from clay. So as I'm going to be talking about carbonate drift, these clay are going to be mud stones, another way to rat stone that will be the equivalent to gravel. So then we go to the second question mark. So mainly produced by the action of a long slope bottom currents. Okay. Uh, have you seen this figure again from the Vesco Edo? They are. Um, Drifts or contrails are occurring in marine environments, but there are other phenomenal phenomena that are controlling the deposition in the marine environment. So one are the density currents that are occurring in the shelf margins and are producing the turbidites, and the other ones are occurring in every basin, the pelagic basin, and just the deposition of the pelagic settling of particles that are suspended in the water column. What happened? Okay, now that we know that there are bottom currents everywhere in the ocean. So if there are bottom currents everywhere in the ocean, all the sediment that is suspended is affected by currents, even if it's 
just a little bit. So there's nothing like a pelagite, everything is a contourite, or is the other way round. The pelagic sediment is the one that is reworked by the contourite. So are they just, the contourite are just special pelagites? So, well, there is not a clear answer. So at the end, contourites are okay, of course, affected by bottom currents, but also controlled by the pelagic setting and mostly affected by density current, which are actually the ones that are uh, introducing the coarse grained material in, in the contourites. Okay, so the last question is, I said, usually a deep marine environment. Okay. If you remember this previous slide, we have this triangle with the pelagic settling, the bottom currents and the density currents. But from literature, we know that drifts are occurring everywhere and any different water depths. They, they can be classified as deep drifts when they are below 3,000 meter water depth, intermediate drift between 3,000 and 300 meters and shallow water uh, uh, drifts, which are occurring in environments shallower than 300 meters. What happened then? If we are speaking about selective classic drifts, there should not be a problem. They are just some different water depth and that's all. But if we are considering carbonate drifts, the water depth is something really uh, important to take into account. Why? Because main carbonate producers such as corals or coralline algae are light dependent. So if we are in a shallower environment, we are going to have more carbonate production. And eventually, if our drift is shallow enough, it may be also colonized by shallow water organisms such as ventiforans or coral or so on. And I'm going to be showing an example of that later on. So. Now we know approximately what is a drift and what is special about carbonate drifts. So where can we find carbonate drifts? So today I'm going to be speaking mostly about the Maldives because the Maldives have a beautiful example of carbonate drifts. But there are other nice examples of carbonate drifts in, in the Marion Plateau, in the Great Barrier in Australia, or in the Santarin Channel next to the, to the Bahamas carbonate platform. So you're starting to see a pattern. Of course, if we are going to have a large sedimentary body that is produced or is just the deposition of huge amounts of carbonate sediment, we need the production of these high amounts of carbonate sediment. And that is only going to happen in the tropical band. So that's why in this huge tropical platform in Bahamas, Maldives, and Australia are where we are going to find this carbonate drift. You may see also some other stars, like here in the Limassol Basin in Cyprus, or here this DB is the Danish Basin in Denmark. Those are not tropical environments, at least nowadays. But Cyprus was within the tropical uh, regime uh, during the Oligocene Miocene, and Denmark was during the Cretaceous. So that's why they have this huge carbonate drifts. Okay, so far we know about the carbonate drift and where to find it. So the other part of the talk is the ethnology of these drifts. So why doing an ethnological analysis of, of this kind of bodies? So first of all, for characterizing the rock or the sediment. So it's the ethnological information. It's going to help us in identifying maybe the rock. So maybe it is different, the bioturbation that we find in a pelagite than in a contrite than in a turbidite. In any case, if we cannot use this as a diagnostic criteria, at least we have a description of the rock that may help us to do some preliminary sedimentology interpretation. So, in, in relation to the fossil assemblage and the intensity of the bioturbation, we can start to make some interpretations about sedimentation rates or the oxygenation of the seafloor. 
that is interesting for both things more that could be separated into the most um, a scientific approach and a more applied approach. So from the scientific point of view, uh, knowing about the sedimentation rate and the oxygenation of the seafloor will help us to do our interpretation about the paleoenvironment, paleoceanography, or the paleoclimatology. But on the other hand, knowing, for example, about the oxygenation of the seafloor is going to tell us about the possible preservation of organic matter and that at the end may be really interesting for characterizing hydrocarbon reservoir. So, ignological analysis is a wonderful tool for that. So now, let's do a practical example to see what is characteristic for the technology of carbon industry. In 2015, I have the chance for sailing, of sailing with um, IODP Expedition 359 to the Maldives. Here you can see the Maldives located southwest to the India in the Indian Ocean. If we see this close up, uh, you see that the Maldives are a double row of atolls, so carbonate islands that are surrounding uh, an inner sea. And this inner sea is especially interesting in this northern part where we have the Cardiva Channel. This Cardiva Channel uh, is produced by currents that are cross cutting the from east to west the, the inner sea of the Maldives. So those currents, these actually bottom currents in the inner, inner sea are the perfect agent for finding uh, carbonate drift. So here is a perfect situation for finding a drift because of the action of these bottom currents. But we have also these atolls which are producing carbonate grains that may be spot by gravity flows. And of course we have hemipelagic rain that is occurring like everywhere. So it's the perfect situation for finding the carbonate drift. You see here site 1466 and 1468, I'm going to be focused uh, primarily in, in these two sites, which are proximal to the um, atoll. And then I will move a bit basing to site 1471 and 1467. We were drilled in the more central part of the inner sea and recover different kind of carbonate drifts. So that is a cross section of the, of the Maldives edifice, which have a drowned platform here in blue. So you can see how the carbonate edifice was prograding and, and aggrading till the complete platform was drowned because actually the action of a strong bottom currents that firstly produce a carbonate uh, a delta drift that is occurring directly on top of the um, slope of, of the carbonate platform of the Maldives. And later on, well, this delta drift is in, in yellow and it's mostly uh, recovered at sites 1466 and 1468. And later on, uh, the sedimentation changed from this delta drift if into a sheeted drift that is kind of tapishing the, the accommodation space in this inner sea. So before starting with, with the actual ignology of the carbonic drift, I think it's interesting to see how or which are the, the ignological features that we find in the underlying sediment of the carbonate slope because the processes producing the sediment are different from those of the drift and in only should be also different. So first of all, at sites 1466, you can see in the lower part in blue, the sediment from the distal slope of the carbonate platform and on top the sediments of the carbonate drift. And they look totally different, both have a uh, high bioperation degree, but in the case of the slope deposits, it is possible to identify uh, discrete trace fossils out of the bioturbated background. So some planolites somewhere, some 
thalassinoides or fucosiform. But in contrast, the, the sediment in the drip is homogeneous. It's not possible to identify. I can tell you that there is some bioturbation going on because when you look closer, you see you can see that there is a different packing of the sediment. So probably there was bioturbation, but it's not the bioturbation degree is so high that it's actually impossible to see the, the bioturbation. If we move a little bit basingward, we see that the bioturbation uh, degree is really high still. And actually in the carbonate platform slope deposits, uh, the intensity is so high that the discrete reposits are starting to be more diffuse. It's still possible to recognize some discrete ray fossil, but not that obvious as before. In contrast, the really homogeneous drip deposits are starting to become uh, not as homogeneous, and eventually some trace fossils may be recognizable. If we move to the most distal part, to site 1467, and we re look on the sediment recovers in the in the lower part of the drift, we saw some faces that look really similar to those of the carbonate slope. A bioturbation degree that is really, really high, it's really intense, but still the discrete tree fossils are kind of common. We can see actually something that is interesting is a mixture of different tiers. We have deep tiers as sulfacos with other ones that are shallower with like thalassinoides or paleophicos. So from proximal to distal, we see that the ignology of, of the drift may be different. So let's start with the ignology of the delta drift. Well, the delta drift consists mostly on packed stones to gray stone, red stone. So it's a coarse grained sediment body, and it characterizes from the ignological point of view by a really, really intense bioturbation degree. It's so intense that, as I said before, the sediment is completely homogenized that we cannot see anything. So here, oh, sorry. There is some discrete trace fossil that look like paleophicos, but most of the time, or the sediment is just partially consolidated, so we cannot recognize any trace fossil. Or we found this that is apparently really homogeneous. Well, not from the grain side point of view, because we have this fine in our um, section that are really beautiful. But then we, when we see the, the most grainy part, no, this sandy part, we saw that there are differences in packing. So that makes us think that the that the bioturbation was there. So bioturbation was intense, but actually so intense that it's hiding itself. If we see oh, the sheet of drift, we have something similar. So bioturbation is really high, but maybe not as high that, as, in the, as in the delta drift, because it is possible to, to recognize individual trace fossils more often than in the delta drift. Still, the sediment is uh, bioturbated throughout, and trace fossils are only recognizable when we have some contrast in colors. When we have phages with different colors, like here, that's possibly able, we are possibly able to uh, identify some trace fossils like thalassinoides, or locally, and that is really interesting, when we have this contact actually in color, it's possible to recognize primary sedimentary structures. That is really interesting because if we are in a, in a drift, we are expecting that bottom currents are producing current structures. But so far, the bioturbation was so high that they were not preserved. So locally in this cheated drift, is. Uh, it's apparently possible to recognize the primary sedimentary structure. Still, when we don't have this, the sediment is really homogeneous and 
really few trace fossils are possible possible to recognize, like panolites, thalassinoides, so so ficus. Again, uh, trace fossils from different tiers mix all together. You may think that okay, that it's working for the Maldives, but what else with other places? So if we study the drift in Bahamas here to the left or in the Marine Plateau in, in Australia to the right, they have exactly the same features. They are bioturbated throughout with an intensity of bioturbation so high that it's not possible to distinguish individual trace fossils. And when it's possible to distinguish is of course in the contact between sediment with different brightness. When that happened, we see some thalassinoides or chondrites, or here, these thalassinoides or thalassinoides and sophicos. So again, the bioturbation so intense, uh, few trace fossils and mixture, few uh, individual trace fossils recognizable, and some the traces from different tiers all mixed together. So I said that we have uh, changes in colors in the sediment that are helping to recognize the bioturbation, but what are those changes in color related? So in the case of the models are mainly related to two things. So first of all is the preservation of organic matter. So here you can see that inside of the trace fossils, particulate or ma organic matter is preserved. For, for example, here there is a thalassinoides the, that is uh, infilled by this particulate organic matter. Uh, well, or sediment enriching particulate organic matter, sometimes the accumulation of organic matter is so high that the barrows, as in, as in C, are directly uh, replaced or, or infilled by, by carbon, by lignite. That is really interesting. So it's pure carbon. The other thing that may change the brightness of the sediment is the different kinds of carbonate that we may find. That could be related because, uh, sorry, I just stopped. We have, when we have carbonate reductions, um, organisms are mostly precipitated either calcite or aragonite. Calcite is kind of stable, but aragonite is not such stable in some conditions and may uh, be dissolved. And these cations are, uh, dilute in the water and go through pores, especially in the galleries with, because burrows change the porosity of the sediment. And there is a particularity of aragonite that sometimes the calcium cation is replaced by strontium. And when we have this accumulation of strontium in, in some traces, we have these infills by celestine as in the sample in D. And it's because of that. So the changing colors, they are not only allows for the recognition of trace fossils, but also for the occurrence of diverse or special infields. If we look at um, carbonate drift from the ignophagous point of view, we can see that the fossil assemblage, as I said so far, with thalassinoides, chondrites, sophicos, paleophicus, pal planolites, might be either cruciana or sophico. Why deciding from one or the other? Just because of the paleobathymetry. As we know from the seismic profiles, the environment was kind of deep. In the case of the Maldives, for example, was around 500 uh, meters below the sea level. So sophicos is an ignophagus that is fitting better for, for carbonate drift. From the ignofabric point of view, we have three different ignofabrics. Uh, just a uh, note, when I'm speaking about ignofabric, I'm considering not only the fossil assemblage, as for, as for the ignofacious, but also the intensity of the vegetation and the kind of sediment. So according to that, we have these three ignophases, so first of all, ignofabrics, first of all, ignofabric one, 
is mostly occurring in the delta drift, and it consists of a Paxton to Radstone, really intensely bioturbated. And as you may see here in this close up, you can see better than previously, there is some differences in, in packing of the sediment that might be related to the bioturbation. So that's oh, a really cryptic bioturbation that, that we can know that will be in the fabric one. In the fabric two, uh, it con consists on a matte stone to pack stone. It's more classical or more typical in sheeted drift, uh, those in the, in the inner sea of the Maldives, but also similar to what I show from Bahamas and Marion Plateau. And the faces may look something like this, but it's a foraminiferal, a plantonic foraminiferal pack stone. And there are two subtypes of this ignofabric. Ignofabric 2A, where the bioturbation is so intense that not any single trace fossil can be distinguished. Or in the fabric 2B, the bioturbation degrees is really high, but it's still few individual trace fossils may be recognizable. And with this particularity, as I said before, with tears from different depths occurring together with sophicles and thalassinoides and planoides all mixed. The last thing in the fabric, in the fabric three, consists of a packstone that show an intercalation of intervals that are heavily bioturbated, like bioturbation degree of six, that is according to, to the grades of, of intensity of bioturbation by Taylor and Goldring. And these heavy bioturbation intervals are intercalated with non-low bioturbation degree to directly absent bioturbation and preservation of primary sedimentary structure. So it's really recognizable in this, in this figure from this core photograph. Here we can see this lamination related to, to the action of bottom current. So, are then primary sedimentary structure common in carbonate drifts? Well, they should be. So here, there is an example of the Petra to Romeo section that is one of the most classical example of onshore drift deposits. And it happens to be that it is a carbonate drift. And here, the drift deposits are characterized by by having this uh, lenticular bedding that is so penetrative and is occurring throughout the, the phases. Yes, for placing a bit uh, this section that is in the western part of Cyprus, here you may see the Petroterumio section in the Limassol basin, that is a neogene basin. And a couple of years ago, I was, with, I was working in Cyprus in the SADA section with colleagues from the University of Hamburg and the University of, of Haifa. We were doing a pure carbonate sedimentology work. And we were really happy to find these sediments from the Oligocene Lefkara formation that are the equivalent of those of the Petra II Romeo section. And we said, oh, here we are in the drift because we have this lenticular bedding occurring. That was really really nice. And then we make in sections. It was surprised that this drift was so fine grained, but not weird because we were working already in the Maldives and we know that the carbon drift may be also mudstone. So, okay, not a big deal. What was interesting, and when we have a closer look in this lenticular bedding, we're starting to see some trace fossils, such as thalassinoides, but also some conical surfaces that look like, like sophagos, like sophagos trace fossils. That happens that there was a road cut nearby with plenty of blocks, so we were possible to see this lenticular bedding in 3D, not only in, in the wall of the outcrop. And then we really recognize that most of the surface of this lenticular bedding 
what's actually the surface of, of these barrels of sulfites. Here you can see like, a, like it was a, an animation that it is actually a, a sophicus trace, trace fossil. These surfaces have even this expression that is characteristic from, from sophicus. Then something make a click in our mind, our eyes turn into recognizing sophicus comes everywhere. And then we saw that they were so abundant that sometimes even in the same handpiece, there was two or more uh, barrels of, of sulfico, this kind of cone. And then we thought, what if this lenticular bedding is not actually a primary sedimentary structure? It's not related to the action of the bottom current, but it's just the accumulation of the different sulficos. So there is an amalgamation of, of barrels that are interpenetrated, interfingered, and they are accumulated in the vertical um, and get preserved in the historical layer. And later, because of the diagenesis and the differential dissolution, they turn into a structure that actually look like lenticular bedding, but have a completely different origin. So back to what I said before, well, is something characteristic to have primary sedimentary structures in carbonate grid? I cannot say so. So from my experience, I will say that bioturbation or intense degree of bioturbation is the most characteristic feature of carbonate grid. And that primary sedimentary structure are just minor things that may or not be may be present. So just a summary of the last of the main keys and so the main features of carbonate drift. I will say, of course, intensive bioturbation is the two words I say the most during this presentation. There is a rare occurrence of individual traces. So they are occurring really, really rarely. And when they occur, they are mostly related to these contacts, this color contact between sediment. Uh, when recognizable, the fossil assemblage is related to the endophages of sophicos. So that means a fossil assemblage with thalassinoid, planolite, sophicos, chondrites, phycosiphon, or paleophicos. And that is interesting that there is a mixture of tiers. So if we, if we go back to this first slide when I said why it is interesting the technological analysis first for characterizing the rock sediment. Okay, we cannot use it for differentiate if it's a pelagite or a contourite or a drift, but at least we are uh, we can use the technology for defining better our rock. We can see, for example, in relation to the sedimentation rate that at least the sedimentation is enough to keep pace with the bioturbation because the bioturbation is so intense and the mix of tiers means that the sedimentation rate uh, was at least enough for bioturbation to keep pace. And we can also say some stuff about the oxygenation of the seafloor. That should be quite good because the bioturbation was intense. The animals borrowing the, the seafloor were really happy in there. Even when bioturbation, uh, when, sorry, when organic matter is locally preserved, the intensity of bioturbation is uh, obviously related to a good oxygenation, good ventilation of the seafloor. And that, of course, can help us to make more precise our previous interpretation about the bioenvironment, the paleoceanography, or the paleoclimatology. So, finally, like the take home message, I will say that ecology is a powerful tool for characterizing environmental conditions at the seafloor that classical sedimentological analysis alone cannot. And if I have some time, I would like to thank, first of all, the um, IODP, or especially the crew and um, scientific party of IODP expedition 359. That was really helpful. Um, without 
the help of these people, it was not possible to have all these samples and pictures that I showed during this presentation. I also have to thank the University of Granada and the Department of Photography of Paleontology for, for hiring me. And also the University of Hamburg and the University of Haifa for funding this research that is currently uh, developing in, in the carbonate deposits of, of Cyprus. And that's all from my side. Thank you for, for your attention. Thanks, Jesus, for the wonderful talk. That was really great. Thank I you. surely learned a lot. Um, so I hope everybody out there watching did as well. So I'm sure you saw the messages in the chat, but please start to type in your questions now, anything that you want to ask Jesus. And um, make sure and also let us know where you're watching from so we can know, uh, yeah, where you're joining us. So I will get this started while we're waiting for other participants to type in their, their questions. So I was wondering, um, so I'm coming from sort of a, a different side of carbonate sedimentology, let's say. I'm not super familiar with carbonate drifts, but um, I was wondering about the amount of bioturbation. So can you relate the amount of bioturbation to um, things like subsequent burial rate or um, sediment supply, strength of the current, anything like that? Well, uh, first of all, maybe one may think that because all these tears happening together and the intensity of bioturbation might be related to not so high degree of, of high sedimentation rates, but that is not the case because usually if we have low sedimentation rates, then we are starting to have hard ground or thin grounds, and then the bioturbation is different. So the sediment uh, was abundant. So the sedimentation rate, as one may expect from uh, our strong bottom current is high, but a still bioturbation is, is possible to keep pace. So to not be buried by the intense sedimentation. So I think that it's probably related by a combination of not only uh, in high sedimentation rates, but having a high amount of organic matter of nutrients in, in the seafloor that it what animals need to live in there, but also a good oxy oxygenation because otherwise there will not be bioturbation. And all this could be easily explained by, by these bottom currents, no? Because sometimes different bottom current may be oxygenated and enriched by organic matter or particulate organic matter coming from the platform or from a different area. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna read out our first question in the chat. Um, John is joining us from Calgary. Hi, John. He says, nice talk. Have you looked at the British chalk? Lots of new work of, on sedimentary structures, bottom currents, and we have extremely abundant and well-preserved um, thalassinoids. Well, I have not looked on the British chalk, but those of the Danish basin, I decided not to show it in here because the, the sediment is so bright, it's so wide, and the bioturbation degree is so intense that it's like showing a white slide, so you're not going to see anything. But they have studied this, and maybe people can find it in the publication that they have about carbonate drifts. And the sedimentation in, in this chalk, at least from those of the Danish Basin, is really similar to that of the sheeted drift on, in the Bahamas or in, or in the Maldives. So really intense, same fossil assemblage, same. A little similar. Um, he also recommends looking at the Paleocene marl quarries around Gubbio. Um, yeah, nice I marl drift deposits. Okay, we have our next question from Javier. Um, they want to know, is it obvious that there are traces in the contours of Cyprus, but there's also a lot of evidence of currents and bed forms. How does your model fit with the ideas recently published by Heiko et al. in 2020? Uh, well, the, the point is that uh, they, well, they have been working quite a lot on the bioturbation um, on this area. So they know, and there is this sedimentary structure in, in the Petra to Romeo section that I said that are supposed to be uh, lenticular bedding. I have 
some questions about that. So my study is mostly in, in uh, let's say, in, uh, wait, in, in the positive from the same time. And so they are lateral equivalent, but they should not be directly the same. So for example, the affection by turbidity currents. So there are these gravity flows that are affecting the contourites um, from the Petra to Romeo section. That is not as obvious in the other section. So that may, uh, may cause some differences in the style of the bioturbation that yeah, may explain the occurrence of some sedimentary structure that are maybe not exactly the same in both places. Mm -hmm. So different types of bioturbation in the two sides. Okay, so well, uh, yes, I mean, ahead. I think they are kind of the same, but maybe some local differences between the because of the turbidity currents. Okay, in one of the locations. Um, okay, our next question comes from Zachary Klein, an amateur geologist from St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Zach. Thanks for joining us. He says, I did some casual field work in Romania a couple of years ago and noted fairly abundant trace fossils in uh, fish deposits around the foot of the Carpathians. I was a bit surprised because I associate them with higher sedimentation rates. Perhaps this relates to, oh, to my question. <laughs> well, that might be without seeing that. Um, it's not, I don't know, it's difficult to say because it's, as I said in the first answer, there is an interplay between the sedimentation rate, the amount of organic matter of, of nutrients uh, or food that is available in the sediment and the oxygenation. So as soon as something is changing, then the intensity and the fossil assemblage uh, or even the fossil assemblage may change. So if we have a high sedimentation rate, but there is no food, then we are not going to have bioturbation, even if, if the oxygenation is good. If we have food and high sedimentation rate, but the, um, there is no oxygenation, then we are going to have an anoxic bottom that is not going to have bioturbation. So at the end, it's an interplay of these three factors. Sure. I guess the question is, how much all of those different factors actually weigh into mm -hmm. the amount of bioturbation, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, our next question comes from Sandra. She says, hi, Jesus. Jesus. Thanks for your interesting talk. It's the first time I saw um, Zuphycos in chondri chondritic sands. Do you have uh, the chance to study the microfaces of the sandier deposits in Cyprus um, to see them under the microscope? As far as I know, these textures are related to rhythmical alterations between compacted and non-compacted layers which are directly linked to suspension and uh, traction alterations, typical from bottom, bottom current affected environments. Yeah, well, that's actually what we were expected. So when we have this lenticular bedding that is supposed to be in kind of sands, so when we have a mixture of, of sandy sediment and more clay sediment, so more muddy, you have these sometimes you have a uh, flasher bedding or lenticular bedding, depending on the scale. So we were expecting such kind of contrast, but that's why I showed this thin section. We were surprised that every, um, every sample that we take from there was a mat zone. So the grain side was really fine and was really homogeneous. So one may expect that maybe in some of the horizons there were uh, more sandy or something like, like this and that not happen. So that's when we found the abundance of FICO, we said like, okay, maybe it's just the accumulation of the of the sofycos and not really the current, because otherwise we will find some asymmetries in the grain size or some yeah variants in the grain size that we are actually not finding. So that doesn't mean that there are not all the currents that are not recognized in such a scale. But at least from our pure carbonate sedimentological, the sediment was really homogeneous. It was only a map zone. Okay. Um, great. Some of my crew from Miami is chiming in here. Um, our first question is from Gregor. Hi, Gregor. Thanks for joining us. 
Um, he wants to know if your def definition as deposited from slope parallel bottom currents when in the delta drift of the Maldives, the current is perpendicular to the slope. I don't know if I get right the answer. Can you repeat it, please? Sure. Yeah, he's wanting to know if your definition as deposited from the slope parallel bottom currents um, is about okay, when now, the, yeah, is perpendicular. Now I know. Uh, well, in the case of the delta drift, there are actually two systems of bottom currents. And yes, Gregory is right. The main currents are cross-cutting the drawn carbonate platform. So that will not be a long slope bottom current will be yeah <laughs> in the slope direction. But there are also some along slope bottom currents flowing from the north that cause some asymmetry. So this delta drift doesn't have totally the shape of a delta. It's not symmetrical because it's is likely deformed toward the south for these bottom currents. But yes that's true. That's why the definition I said mainly by bottom current, I probably should not have said along slope and just said bottom current will be in the safer place. So it sounds like the, um, the ones in the Maldives are created by a combination of both slope parallel and um, slope perpendicular currents. Is that right then? Yeah, well, the drift of the Maldives and actually they are produced by different direction because even the along slope bottom currents are flowing from different directions in depends on which part of the of the inner sea you are placed so yeah and these small straits are also adding an extra level of complexity okay so our next question also comes from the university of miami from sarah hi jesus great talk can the ichnophages tell us which part of the slope um, example middle or upper that we are looking at I, I will not say so, because as I said before, um, the you know, assemblage is so similar. So in the slope, it's really similar to that of the, of the drift. So the fossil assemblage is from the ignophages in between Cruciana and Sophicos. And since they are really similar, it's difficult to put a border of when it's starting Cruciana and South Pecos. I mean, if you don't have the, the seismic. So if you are completely blind in the field and you don't know what is your paleobathymetry, I think in this case, in this case, bioturbation will not be really helpful. There are some other features as the grain size that may be helping to identify, but I also have another work about the bioturbation in the slopes. Um, and it's changing when you move upslope, but not as much as one may expect from other features as, as this little faces, mm -hmm. for example. OK. Um, our next question comes from Antoine. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Have you been able to relate the traces to particular benthic into, uh, invertebrates? And he's coming from Vancouver. Well, there are, so that was not the intention of, of this work, but there are some traces that are already linked. So not by me, but authors working with bioturbation uh, have already interpreted that some trace fossils belongs to crustaceans and some other belongs to anelids, or sometimes there are even some which could be produced either by crustacean fish and a kind of an elite in the panel on the situation, but that was not the case of this study. So it was not worrying about the trace maker. Okay, our next question comes from uh, Kazuma. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, coming from Japan, <laughs> in midnight Japan. How could you observe the differences of lateral continuity between three ichnophages and any effects to reservoir quality? Well, so first of all, I, I do not like that much the term of ignophages. So if I want to characterize um, a hydrocarbon reservoir, I will use better the, the approach of the ignofabrics. 
because then you're considering also the sediment fabric, the texture of the sediment that is more interesting when we are, want to characterize the, the porosity of this hydrocarbon. And, and of course, it will really depend on, on which ignofabrics you have, but ignofabric with low bioturbation, bioturbation indexes um, and a small grain size may be occurring as seals that, that are really interesting for avoiding the hydrocarbon to escape. And those of the carbonate drip, which are uh, really intensely bioturbated, and especially those of the delta drip, we have um, uh, a big grain side, could be also interesting as a source of um, have a, a store rock better to say. But it will depend on in each case with ignofabric you are defining for, for your possible reservoirs. Okay. Um, so our next question comes from, oh, no. Nope. Okay, that's just from SEDS Online. So I think that um, our last question was the one that you just answered. And thank you so much again for the wonderful talk. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we have our next webinar with Nigel uh, Mountney, who's going to talk up to us about environmental changes recorded in alien deposits. So join us next week, same place, same time, and we will see you then.